Hey everybody, it's Phil Ralston from Sunday's 10 o'clock service. I am at the Mijos restaurant at Durango Station. The food is excellent, the decorations are pretty cool. It's a neat little bar and restaurant. If you can get out here, it's uh, worth, worth the drive from Henderson. Hope you enjoy service with Pastor Diane. We'll see you soon. Want to say an extra thank you, Phil, today because Phil has been filming and sharing these introductions to our online worship now for four years. We really appreciate you, Phil, you being here for us each week. Welcome to Worship at Christ the Servant from our living room to yours. We are honored that you have chosen to worship with us in this way today. So turn up the volume and let's get started. We come from far and wide, anticipating We're gathered in this place and now we're waiting Surrounded by your heavenly embrace Showering us with your abundant grace So we give it all to Graciousness amazes Accept our joyful gift of songs and praises We offer up our lives in service here Confident that you are always near So we give it all to music here express with never-ending mercy you will bless so we give it all to In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray together. Dear Father, I ask you to give me strength to live this day as you would have me live it. Guide me in shining with the light of Jesus Christ in my words and actions. Fill me with your spirit so that I may be for others an instrument of hope, peace, and love. Use me to bring joy to others so that they may understand the life you desire for all your children. Amen. God hears your prayer and fills you with the power to live today, tomorrow, and every day, enjoying new and abundant life. Live in newness of life. Amen. Amen. Thine is the glory, risen conquering sign. Endless is the victory, thou art dead hast won. Angels in bright raiment roll the stone away. At the folded grave closed where thy body Thine is the glory, risen.
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, with joy we celebrate the day of our Lord's resurrection. By the grace of Christ among us, enable us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. 
With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is a, a very, very early glimpse into the Christian community. This would be just a matter of weeks, just some, maybe at most a couple of months or so from the resurrection that Jesus had uh, been risen from the dead. And so we hear also a little earlier, we're in the book of Acts, by the way, for the next uh, several weeks during the whole season of Easter, our first reading will always be from the book of Acts. And so we're hearing again about the beginnings of the Christian church. You know, again, those early days after experiencing the Easter event, the resurrection of Jesus. And so once we've heard or had the event of the resurrection of Jesus, well, what next? That's kind of what we're looking at in these immediate weeks following Easter. Of course, the what next question keeps going on. It never, never does go away. But in this early days of the Christian church, we're hearing about uh, the, the impact of the Holy Spirit, but also very importantly, how strong that message about the resurrection. We're getting like a snapshot of the early church and how they live and exist in light of the resurrection. And so one of those things that uh, is very evident is that with great power, the testimony of the resurrection to the Lord Jesus is going on. And that actually means a lot. It's always important when you're looking in Bible Bible readings, it's always good to look a little before, a little after, uh, get a bit of the context. And I think that the fact that the disciples, the apostles, now they're apostles, they are ones who are sent out to share the message about Jesus Christ, uh, is that with great power, they are sharing the testimony of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Well, just shortly before this, uh, affirmation of how boldly they are giving this testimony still, Peter and John were arrested by some Jewish leaders and they were severely threatened. Now they weren't put in jail yet, that comes a little later, but they were severely threatened by the Jewish leaders to stop preaching about Jesus, to stop preaching about the resurrection. And the reply is, we can't. We can't stop. We can't hold this back. We have to share this message, this good news that Jesus is risen from the dead. And so that's what they're doing. They're being bold and they are proclaiming even though they are being threatened. And not only are they preaching with great power, they are also with that preaching is the formation of a new community the earliest of the Christian community, the earliest of the believers about Jesus, and that he was the, the Lord and he is the one who God raised from the dead to bring us God's great grace. I love that phrase, great grace. That is how, how much, it is a grace that is upon all. It is a grace that is offered to all, including us so that with that grace, uh, the people are living as forgiven and forgiving people. And with that grace, that abundant grace of God, uh, people are moved to live in a sense of abundant grace themselves. And that means looking out for one another, um, being in a habit of sharing. Now, the, what is described here early in the book of Acts uh, it may have been a unique moment, but even if it was only for a unique moment in the very early days of, of Christianity, it still gives us a vision of where we always should be heading in our faith. Again, living out the resurrection in our lives each day. And again, the goodness of God, the abundance of God, the generous grace of God 
is something that we should be in the habit of sharing. And that is both in sharing that forgiveness and mercy and grace with each other, and also sharing as we are able to support and just give help when someone is in need. Our Psalm for today is Psalm 133. How good and how pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head, flowing down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, flowing down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon, flowing down upon the hills of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. So this psalm, which is a very brief psalm, uh, begins with a wonderful phrase, a wonderful statement. Uh, I think it is a statement that definitely reflects what was going on, uh, what we just heard described about the Christians and their way of being together uh, very early on in the book of Acts and the early days of Christianity. Uh, how good and how pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. I have to say that word kindred is um, an interesting one. Sometimes we think of uh, kindred means just one's own immediate family, or maybe it means someone's extended family, but I think also it could be understood in a very, very broad way, more like just when, when people live together in unity. Uh, truth is we know there's a lot of disunity and even within one congregation of people uh, together, there's not always a great, uh, great unity or as much unity as one hopes. Well, the thing is, though, it's not saying we have, as people, God's people, we agree on every single thing, uh, every single uh, po politics for sure, uh, but it is about what makes us united. And what makes us is united is that we are a people brought together by God's grace. And that's what we're remembering, that great grace that we heard mentioned in Acts, and that great grace that God shows us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which makes us reconciled with God and with one another. So it is that grace of God which gives us unity. It is the grace of God which brings us together will always be different people, but we all are blessed by God's goodness, by God's forgiveness, by God's mercy, by God's grace, and it is abundant and it is overflowing. That's kind of the rest of those images in the Psalm. And being blessed with that abundant and overflowing generosity of God's grace, we get to be together, we get to be God's people together. Our next reading is from 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 2. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light, he himself is in the light. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins 
and cleanse us from all right unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay, whew, that's a lot. This is a message that was written to, again, still early Christians, but much, much later on, much later than what we heard about from the reading from the book of Acts. Uh, these were Christians who were living closer to the end of the first century. They had probably heard the Gospel of John. That was probably their main message about Jesus and his ministry and his death and his resurrection and then the witness. Uh, this is what is being shared here. So again, it's that kind of that what next question still going on in the very later in the first century. And again, that's the question that never goes away. Jesus has risen from the dead. What next? Well, part of what next is that still sharing that message, still sharing that testimony, still telling about what was heard, what was seen, what was looked at, what was touched, how they had received to know about Jesus. And I think that doesn't ever go away. We, wherever we are even now, received a witness from people before us. Now the people before us might be um, real people we've known in our own, our own lives, but people before us can also be what is shared in the scripture, which we are hearing today. That's an important part of receiving that witness about Jesus Christ. And not just receiving it, but knowing that we belong, knowing that that gift of the message of Jesus' death and resurrection and being made right with God, being brought into fellowship with Jesus, with the Father, that that is something that does shape our lives. It's something that is more than just affirming or making the bold, still bold proclamation, you know, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, alleluia. Uh, this is only the second week of Easter, so it's great to still get to say that. Uh, we get to get into the rest of life, and that is holding on to that relationship with Jesus. The way it's sort of indicated is to walk in the light, walking in the light. And the thing is, we know that we don't always do that. We, we sometimes go off in our own way, uh, become more self-centered, more drawn in towards just oneself, instead of, again, living out that relationship of God's goodness and God's mercy and God's forgiveness. But what I appreciate, at least also in 1 John, is that reassurance that uh, Jesus Christ has also taken the cross and then taken our sin, that we are right with God, and that even when we might not always walk in the light, we can always trust that we have one who is there, who is always on our side, and that we always, always know that our sins are forgiven and we can continue that day-by-day -day re relationship of walking in the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our gospel reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and verse 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked 
For fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord Jesus and said to them, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. So this is always the gospel reading that comes the week after Easter. Uh, every year on Easter we hear a particular gospel depending which year of whether the year of Matthew whether, or the year of Luke or the year of Mark, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, whichever year it is. But this, the next week, it's always this gospel from John. And I, I do appreciate it very much, although, again, uh, once in a while I think, gee, could we ever change this up a little bit? But it's just what's given to us. And there's a lot to be said for always hearing this. It is actually what we hear it begins on the end of the first Easter day, which says when it was evening on that day, that day is the very first Easter, at least uh, from the Gospel of John. So it's just later on Easter day, and there, this is, again, this is giving us a picture. Now this is a super early, early picture of that question, Jesus has risen from the dead, what next? Well, they were inside, and they were afraid and the doors were locked. Now on the plus side, I will say this, they were together. That's, that's actually good. Uh, they could have just been all scattered apart, but they were together. And I think that's, that's very meaningful, even, even just by that. But they were afraid because their leader had been killed. And even though there was this message coming that Mary said, I have seen the Lord. At this moment, uh, this was just a message. The others hadn't seen the Lord. Well, that's about to change. And so in spite of uh, locked doors, Jesus comes. Uh, I like the thought of uh, Jesus breaks in, um, but he doesn't even have to use a door. He just breaks in. It's almost like the opposite. You know, Jesus himself had been in the tomb and then he had come, you know, was raised and he was out of the tomb. And it's like the disciples have kind of put themselves in a tomb and uh, put the stone across. And Jesus is like, nothing's going to stop me from being here and letting you know that I am raised. I am alive. And so he comes and is there right in their midst, and his very first word is peace. Peace be with you. Uh, I think that has lots of levels, because first of all, of course, they would have been shocked. They were already afraid because of what the Jewish leaders 
might possibly do to them. So they're already afraid of that. And then all of a sudden Jesus comes and he's right there. He didn't even walk through the door. So there's all the sorts of reasons they should have been afraid, alarmed, uh, shocked. And so his first message, peace, okay, that makes a lot of sense. But there's another part of that too when, when I think about it is that how, do you, how would people greet one another? Just like, you know, you, you've been apart and you come together and you say peace. In the Hebrew, the word would be shalom. Uh, Jesus had been giving them that, that kind of almost normal greeting, like we're together, shalom. And then he shows them, it's me. It's, he shows them that he is the one who died and now is alive. It is the very same person. It's not someone else. And it's not a ghost either. That's really important too. He is fully there in, in his resurrected body. Then, then they're excited and they're happy and they're celebrating. And then he says, peace be with you. Uh, this is now, the word shalom can be a greeting, but it can also be kind of like a like shalom, like a goodbye. It's a hello and a goodbye. It's a little bit almost like aloha. Aloha in the Hawaiian culture can be both a greeting, but also a, um, an expression of, you know, saying goodbye to at the same time. So this is kind of a both and here. And then he commissions them. So he has welcomed them in their greeting. And now he is commissioning them to go forward to carry out that message of peace you could say as the father sent me so i send you they are going to carry out the ministry that jesus had been doing they are being sent out to carry that on and then gives the holy spirit and it is by the power of the spirit the holy spirit they're going to be able to do the ministry that jesus has done and then it talks about forgiveness I like that too, that reminder that Jesus is in the business of forgiveness and that's our business too. That's, that's what we are also meant to bring to the world just as Jesus brought to the world. We too are commissioned to carry out that forgiveness that Jesus brings and offer that to others as well. Well, this is all very exciting and this is a very big event and they're they're very joyful and then later Thomas gets there and I always feel bad for Thomas you know sometimes it's always looked upon as you know well why couldn't he trust what they said why could why did he have any doubts well what he really was more than anything what he was asking for he wasn't doubting necessarily that they had seen Jesus, but what he really wanted was he wanted that encounter. It, I could see from his perspective that that would seem a little bit unfair. Mary could say, I have seen the Lord. All the other apostles could say, I have seen the Lord. And Thomas would be like, I can't say I have seen the Lord. He would have felt. It's almost like if you've there's been some really fun special event friends of yours have shared in and then they tell you all about it and they're just all excited and bubbly and then they go oh wish you'd been there if only if you could see, have seen it and you're like you're both happy that they had such a great experience but you're kind of like yeah i didn't i didn't get to well jesus shows i think a great uh, pastoral care for thomas because he makes a special effort, you could say, to make sure that Thomas isn't missing out. And so it does take a week, a week goes by, but, <clears throat> excuse me, and then they are together again. Uh, Jesus, who is the wounded healer, offers Thomas what he needs, how he needs to have that, again, that unique kind of personal connection with Jesus that he had lived with for the past three years. And he exclaims once he does meet Jesus and have that encounter, my Lord and my God, you know, he is, he is all in. 
He, he is just, again, just as enthusiastic as all the others were. I think also in the midst of this story comes a reassurance to all of us because of course we are hearing this from the reports of others. This isn't our direct experience, but we are the ones who are blessed, as Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Uh, it's, it's kind of pushing away that, you know, I won't believe it until I see it. Well, there's other ways of coming to know the truth that Jesus is risen from the dead. And it's, it's also about being able to connect and be in relationship with Jesus. That's what really this is about. It's not necessarily, as much as it is, it is something we do want to say and do affirm, I believe in Jesus Christ, my own, God's only Son, our, my Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descend to the dead, on the third day rose again. I mean, we, we, we proclaim this, we make this statement of faith, and that does matter, and that is important. But what's more than just a statement, what matters way more is a relationship. And that's, I think, what is being affirmed here, is that relationship that is what Thomas experiences, is something that is there for all of us. We all still have that unique, personal relationship with our risen Lord Jesus Christ. And that is something we continue to share and continue to celebrate and continue to give thanks to God for our Lord Jesus Christ. Rejoicing in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we pray for the witness of the church, the wholeness of creation, and all who are in need. Holy God, you speak peace in the presence of fear. Give us courage to testify to your grace with our lives. Embolden prophets, preachers, and teachers to speak your truth. Lord, we give you praise, for you always hear us. Holy God, you are peace in a violent world. Heal neighborhoods ravaged by crime. Reconcile political factions at war. Build relationships where suspicion keeps us apart. And bring us to the day of unity. Lord, we give you praise, for you always hear us. Holy God, you bring peace to a hurting world. Fill the stomachs of the hungry. Bind up the shattered. Give rest to the weary and hope to the disillusioned. Restore the sick. Lord, we give you praise, for you always hear us. Holy God, your, you breathe your spirit of peace into us. Enlivened by the Spirit, equip us to bring new life to all we meet in our work and in our play. Lord, we give you praise, for you always hear us. We entrust all our prayers to you, gracious God. Receive them by the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you. in speaking these words. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Stay in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we'll worship again together next week. <music>